everyone to the uh, first meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchising of this, the 11th session of the New York City Council. Uh, I am uh, Francisco Moya, the chair of the subcommittee. Uh, I am happy to be joined by uh, my colleagues here today, uh, Casa Constantinidis, uh, Rory Lansman, Steve Levin, Donovan Richards, Richie Torres, Barry Grudenchek, uh, Carlino Rivera, and we are also joined uh, today by Council Member uh, Cumbo. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, today we will be holding hearings on three items, uh, one being the sidewalk cafe and two rezoning applications. Uh, we also have a sidewalk cafe application that was called up and subsequently withdrawn by the applicant. Uh, so we will be voting to remove that item from our calendar and we will begin the hearings uh, on the sidewalk uh, cafe. Uh, the cafe for the hearing today is uh, LU2, the Brown Sugar Bar and Restaurant Sidewalk Cafe application. Uh, this is an application by the restaurant owner uh, for a revocable consent to maintain and operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe uh, to be located at 5060 Broadway in uh, Council Member Rodriguez's district in Manhattan. And uh, I will now open the public hearing on LU2. Uh, since there are uh, no one who is uh, signed up, if there is any members of the public who wish to testify on this item, uh, please let us know. Uh, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on this item. Uh, we will now move on to the public hearing on the first of our two rezoning applications. Uh, LU3, uh, the 116 Bedford Avenue rezoning. Uh, this application uh, submitted by uh, 116 Bedford Avenue LLC would establish a C14 uh, commercial overlay uh, district within the existing R6A district. The new commercially overlay would apply to the western side of uh, Bedford Avenue between North 10th and North 11th Street in Council Member uh, Levin's district in Brooklyn. I will now open the public hearing on LU3. Uh, and we have here um, Richard uh, Lobel from uh, Sheldon and Lobel. Um, and we also have Frank St. Jacques. Did I say that correctly? Yes. All right, perfect. Thank you. Good morning and uh, congratulations to the newly constituted Zoning and Franchise Subcommittee, as well as to Chair Moya. We look forward to being the answer to a New York City tri Trivial Pursuit question as to the first substantive hearing before the committee. So <laughs> we're excited about that. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for hearing us today on the 116 Bedford Avenue rezoning. Again, I'm Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC. I'm joined by Frank St. Jacques. And we have the uh, owners of 116 Bedford Avenue with us as well. And so the application, of course, is for a rezoning. And while we come to the subcommittee with a range of rezoning applications, this one is an extremely minor type of rezoning. And as you can see from the uh, cover page, involves merely a commercial overlay, a C14 overlay, placed on an existing R6A district. So a highlight of the proposed rezoning can be seen in the red circle. Um, currently, the uh, property is within the block frontage on uh, Bedford Avenue between North 10th and 11th is an R6A zoning district. And so we're merely adding a C14 dist uh, overlay district. What does this do? It does not change the underlying bulk. It doesn't change uh, the envelope of the building. What it does is it enables this block frontage now to have ground floor commercial use. And so um, it would add this commercial overlay on this one block front. Uh, next, next slide. So uh, here's a, a relief uh, eagle eye view of the block front between North 10th and North 11th. Next slide. And so this is just a, uh, a map which shows with a little bit more specificity, specificity what is ex actually existing on this block. So uh, the block itself was zoned M12R6 for quite some time from 1961 through 1975, and then there was a rezoning through 2005. So for about 40 years, it existed as an M12R6 block. In the Greenpoint Williamsburg rezoning in 2005, this block frontage was not given a commercial overlay. However, the 
six blocks along the western side of Bedford Avenue to the south were all zoned commercial. So it's clearly part of a, an existing commercial thoroughfare along Bedford. In addition, you can see three block frontages to the east side of Bedford here are also zoned C14. And so the applicant here is attempting to type of kind of reestablish what actually exists on the ground on the zoning map. And you can see that by looking at the next slide, which is existing uses. So uh, the red dots in that highlighted area on the western side of the block front uh, constitute the commercial use, current commercial uses or uh, buildings which are legally commercial, meaning they've got a commercial storefront in which commercial use can be reactivated. And so you've got our lot highlighted in green, and then you've got on this block front five additional uh, storefronts. So of the total of nine lots, because there's one lot on North 10th Street which exists to the rear of the frontage, of the nine lots that are located on this uh, block front, the commercial overlay district here would result in legalizing six of these using uses, making them legal continued commercial uses. They're able to exist legally now, but they are legal non-conforming uses, which leads to issues when, for example, they want to make changes at the Department of Buildings if they want to uh, receive any type of bank financing, whereas the uh, commercial overlay will reestablish really what's uh, existing on the ground. So in the materials presented to city planning and beyond, we've presented uh, what actually exists on each of the site, and we can run through those very quickly. You have at 110 Bedford Avenue, the Bedford, which is a local restaurant. Um, walking through the sites, you then have 112 Bedford and 114 Bedford, which are both the residential store, uh, residential ground floor uses. Um, as an aside, 114 has also given a consent to this application. 116 is the project site. The site right now has uh, Department of Buildings plans and approvals for community facility use on the ground floor. They are, are able to do that as of right. The is, this is a, you know, would, would be able to operate as a doctor's office. And as an aside, doctor's offices could be considered both use group four community facility and use group six commercial. So you can see that there's really very close use pattern between what would be permitted and what we're seeking here. Uh, you can go to the next few slides. So you have 118 Bedford, which was an existing commercial use. I understand that the owner has fallen ill, so that, that use is commercial but is not currently used for its former use as a, as a food store. Uh, 120 Bedford, which is now, uh, I understand, opening a sandwich shop. And then 122 Bedford, also a commercial frontage, uh, at which, which is currently vacant. And then finally, 124 Bedford, which has uh, an existing uh, bar restaurant as well as a uh, salon and then uh, the around the corner, that additional lot we talked about being 143 North 10th Street. So indeed, well over 50% of the uses on this block frontage are either commercial or legally allowed to be occupied by commercial. Um, the zoning map comparison on the next page demonstrates what we showed before, which is the existing R6A versus the R6A with the C14. And then more broadly on the next page with the land use map, it's interesting to note that um, these blocks are actually um, have existing commercial use beyond the, s the frontages. So if you take a look at the M12 R6A, there's an M12 R6A district already existing on this block itself, which means that within 100 feet of these properties, sometimes less, you would be able to occupy that space with a seriously intensive commercial use and M12 use, uh, manufacturing use. So this is not a block which is foreign to commercial uses. Um, should those be desired in, M in an M12 district. Um, the rezoning rationale on the last page, and I'll be um, f finishing up soon in case anyone has any questions. Um, but the rezoning rationale is, of course, first that it's consistent with these existing six blocks of C14 overlay. Um, it brings the local commercial uses into conformance. It would permit new commercial use in line with existing patterns in the area, as was noted by city planning, and will not alter the currently permitted R6A bulk. I would note that if you look one block to the west, you see two C24 uh, overlays along Barry on the western side and one on the eastern side. And those overlay districts actually 
did not exist uh, prior to rezonings in 2009 and 2011. Um, those you know, basically were for C24 districts, which are arguably a little bit more intensive than a C14 district, permit a greater range of commercial uses. And we're also, on, uh, in the case of the C24s on the western portion, were on blocks which were entirely re zoned residential as opposed to our lot. So by way of comparison, again, we're asking for C14. Those were C24. Our block has an existing M12 mixed-use district. Those blocks were entirely R6 residential. Um, and again, uh, just hitting on the rezoning rash rationale, five of these eight buildings representing 125 feet of frontage uh, currently have commercial use as well. Only two, blo uh, two lots uh, amounting to 50 feet or 25% of the frontage are residential. Um, finally, neighborhood support. Uh, there's a, a, a map which demonstrates the consents that were received by the applicant. Uh, after the community board hearing, when it was apparent that there was going to be more discussion about this application, uh, the, the owners went out and, and solicited consents from the neighbors. They were, as you can see in the green dots on the block frontage, able to receive um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 consents inclusive of the project site. Uh, and the ninth, one of the, uh, one of the properties, 118 Bedford, currently has a commercial frontage. So uh, out of the nine lots affected by this rezoning, eight of them have either issued consents or have existing commercial frontage, leaving only one uh, lot that was, uh, you know, that did not issue a consent or had commercial. Finally, um, we discussed the CPC approval, which was that um, the MAP amendment would facilitate the use of ground floor commercial at 116 Bedford, um, that it would bring these five other commercial uses into conformance, that C14 as a district allows local retail uses is seen to be compatible with local retail and as well as as well as R6A, uh, uh, an R6A district. This is, this, is that, um, this is a district which is mapped many times throughout the city on R6A districts. Uh, and then the commission believes that extending the existing C14 would be consistent with land use along Bedford Avenue. Finally, there's the applicant commitments. The applicant um, did issue a letter to both the Brooklyn Borough President and subsequently the City Planning Commission. And basically, in response to some of the concerns that were raised, um, designated certain conditions that they would satisfy, that they would designate a primary point of contact, a superintendent or management company to receive and address concerns related to the building, provide contact information for the commercial tenant to address immediate onside concerns, require a commercial tenant to consult a sound engineer, require that tenant to limit any applicable hours of operation for a sidewalk cafe and to install security cameras and lighting to minimize safety concerns. I, I would note that the owners here are have six residential units in the building. Uh, th this is their building going forward. They, of course, want to be good neighbors. They want to make sure that they're not um, going to be doing anything adverse to both their tenants but also to the larger community. So we're uh, excited about the opportunity here and we hope we can proceed in a successful fashion. And so that concludes our statements with regards to the rezoning and uh, we remain uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, council member Le Levine has, uh, Levin, sorry, has uh, questions. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My apologies to everybody um, for keeping you waiting. Um, uh, so, uh, Richard, I just want to uh, uh, acknowledge um, that uh, the community board did vote against this uh, proposal um, unanimously. Yes. Um, and uh, you spoke about uh, outreach that was done by the owner subsequent to that vote. I did speak with a um, representative from the community board this morning. Um, and, uh, you know, the reason why uh, the community board voted, um, if I were to characterize their vote, um, is that along Bedford Avenue, as anyone, uh, uh, a lot of New Yorkers would know, um, particularly Brooklynites, that it, you know, Bedford Avenue in the north side of Williamsburg has really turned into, um, it's kind of like Greenwich Village, you know, in the, in the, in the 60s or something. It's, it's, a, it's a huge amount of um, nightlife activity. Um, you know, nights and weekends are really turned into, a, you know, this kind of international party scene, um, which, you know, is it, it was all uh, accompanying 
uh, disturbances. So the concern that uh, residents have is, is just another bar that would be open till 4 a.m. Uh, that uh, would contribute to um, you know, more disturbances along uh, one of the qu quieter blocks of Bedford Avenue on the north side. So um, the commitment that uh, the applicant made, uh, Brooklyn Standard Properties, in a letter uh, today, which uh, it, I don't think you mentioned any, any commitments not. here, is that um, in addition to these commitments that, that you would refrain or your, your uh, client would refrain from leasing the ground floor commercial space to a bar or a nightclub tenant, um, that would be well received by the community at large. Um, uh, you know, understanding that there's a, uh, uh, an existing um, uh, reality on that block with the commercial tenants, um, that those uses can continue in perpetuity, whether it's the current uh, proprietor or a future proprietor. Uh, that includes uh, on the other properties uh, on the block aside from this property, uh, bar and nightclub use um, pending, you know, or a, a, a liquor license approval by SLA. So, um, the commitment to refrain from re uh, leasing to a bar uh, or nightclub, uh, I think, is it would be well received. And in light of that, I'm, I'm willing to uh, uh, lend my support to this application. Um, uh, you know, so long as that commitment is honored. Uh, Council Member Levin, uh, the applicant remains completely committed to making that uh, commitment to the, to to you, to the council, to the community board. Uh, you are correct. I mean, the notation in the in the committee's discussion at the community board was that um, the committee noted these concerns were in line with the standing concern of the full board that there has been an uncontrolled proliferation of bars and pubs, and so in an effort to directly address that, um, the applicant issued that letter to you and remains um, completely committed to doing so and and hopefully will move forward in a way that's going to um, satisfy everyone in the community Great. thank you thank you I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, the chairman of uh, land use uh, councilman uh, Salamanca uh, thank you for being here this morning um, now are there um, any anyone else that had questions from the panel? No. Uh, are there any members of the public uh, who wish to testify on this item? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on this item. Uh, thank you for uh, being here this morning. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the uh, last application for today's public hearing is the 587 uh, Bergen Street rezoning application, the uh, LUs 4 and 5. Uh, this application consists of a change in zoning district from a M11 district to an R6B district for the development site fronting on Bergen Street to the west of Carlton Avenue and for several other properties fronting on Dean Street. Uh, the related text amendment application would apply uh, the mandatory inclusionary housing program option 1 and 2 to the area. Uh, on the development site, the rezoning would facilitate a new 26 unit residential building. Uh, the building would include approximately 10 units of affordable housing, averaging at either 60 or 80 percent of the area uh, medium uh, income, uh, depending on the MIH option selected by the developer. Uh, this application is uh, located in Councilmember uh, Cumbo's district in Brooklyn, <coughs> and I will now open the public hearing on LUs 4 and 5. Uh, and we have uh, Jonathan uh, Reinsmith, Josh, sorry, uh, Reinsmith, uh, who's here today to testify. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, good morning, Chair Moya and uh, members of the committee um, and Council Member Cumbo. Um, uh, my name is Josh Reinsmith. I'm Land Use Counsel uh, for the applicant from the law firm of Ackerman LLP. I'm joined this morning by Nora Martins from Ackerman, as well as Lauren, Lauren Malotra Gadet, um, who is um, a representative of the developer. Um, this is an application, as was mentioned, to extend an existing R6B zoning district um, to cover a, a property that is located in an M11 district um, that is immediately adjacent to an existing R6B. Um, 
the property is located just south of the Pacific Park um, development project and a few blocks um, to the east and south of uh, the Barclays Center. So go to the next slide. Um, the existing site uh, is a combination of three tax lots having approximately 12,400 square feet of lot area. It's currently zoned M11, um, which permits commercial and manufacturing and some community facility uses. Uh, I'd just like to note that the maximum permitted FAR in the existing zoning district is 2.4, um, which is actually uh, more floor area than is per uh, permitted in the R6B district that, that is being sought. Um, and the property has historically been vacant um, since at least 1965 and has been used um, as a, a parking lot. Um, next slide. So the proposed zoning uh, application, again, is to extend that R6B uh, zoning district to cover the property. Um, and that would facilitate the development of a four-story 27,000 square foot multi-family residential building with 26 total units, um, 10 of which would be uh, permanently affordable under um, the MIH program. Uh, the zoning application also includes a text amendment to designate um, the uh, property uh, in the rezoning area as a mandatory designated area. So here is just a, a slide showing the um, uh, existing and proposed zoning map, and again, it is just the extension of this existing uh, district boundary to en encompass the, the development site. Um, the proposed development would be four stories. Um, it would have a subsurface parking garage, um, a base height of 38 feet, which um, we're seeking to um, essentially mirror the height of the street wall of the adjacent townhomes to our west, which are located in the Prospect Heights Historic District, um, and would have a total height of 50 feet. Um, again, I mentioned it would have 26 dwelling units. Um, the developer uh, is a, a developer and holder of long-term assets and rental buildings, um, and so we are gearing uh, the building's unit distribution towards larger units that are available for families. So in that regard, uh, there are no studios within the building, um, and the, the current unit layout is 14 one-bedrooms and 12 two-bedroom units. Um, let me go back. Uh, and uh, there would be 13 parking spaces within the subsurface garage, which would exceed the, the zoning requirement. Um, during the community board review, we had met with uh, the land use committee of community board aid as well as the pool community board. Um, the community board uh, passed a resolution in support of the application um, on two conditions. Um, the first was, if you could go to the next slide, uh, I'm sorry, one more. Um, the first was that uh, we modify the original design of the building. If you can see the rendering on the left was what was originally proposed. And on each end of the building, we had two permitted obstructions um, within the initial uh, height limitation called dormers. Um, and one of the concerns that was raised by the community was that these dormers did not align um, and maintain the street wall context of the existing townhomes that are located um, to the west and also within the Prospect Heights Historic District. Um, and so in response to that, we agreed to um, provide uh, a full 15-foot setback on the, um, the fourth floor um, in order to maintain the street wall context and align the height of our street wall with that of the adjoining townhomes um, and to reduce the visibility of the fourth floor from um, the street. The second um, condition was that we provide 24-hour um, contact information um, for the developer and the developer's project manager um, upon the commencement of construction um, so that uh, members of the uh, surrounding uh, properties um, both on Bergen Street and Dean Street as well as the community board would have access to the developer in during construction um, to uh, get in contact with us in the event that there are any concerns or issues arise. Um, and then uh, we have been um, in 
contact and discussions with uh, council members, uh, council member Cumbo's office. Um, and we'd like to thank um, the council member and her staff for their time and effort and, and guidance in connection with the project. Um, the application, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned before, when it was originally submitted to the city planning commission and approved, um, the MIH uh, designated areas were going to be mapped uh, with both options one and options two. Um, at the council member's uh, suggestion, um, we looked into the feasibility of eliminating option two um, from the text amendment um, and just proceeding with option one, which would provide our affordable apartments at deeper levels of affordability. Um, and we have uh, agreed to that modification to the land use application. Um, and so now um, the, uh, the affordable apartments would be provided at an average of 60% AMI with 10% of the, the uh, units being um, at 40%. AMI. Um, so in addition to um, that commitment, we've also reiterated some of the commitments we made to both the community board and the borough president. Um, the first is uh, the uh, re reduction in the dormers um, so that they're set back to maintain that street wall context. Um, the second was the 24-hour contact information for the project's developer. Uh, in addition, um, we will be working with local uh, third party administering agents who will be responsible for the marketing and lease up of the affordable apartments. Um, and we're looking to incorporate green and sustainable design features in the building um, and currently are investigating the use of a combination of a solar and green roof to the building. Um, lastly, I'd like to, to reiterate that the developer is a minority business enterprise um, and we're, we're currently seeking um, city certified MWBE um, uh, certification. Um, but we are a local Brooklyn based developer um, and uh, historically on our projects uh, approximately 50% if not more of the subcontracts and suppliers uh, on our projects are Brooklyn based and we will work with both the council member and the borough president to advertise um, subcontracting opportunities uh, when the time arises. Um, that's uh, essentially an overview of, of the project and, and the commitments that we've made. I'm happy to answer any questions. Council member Cumbo. Thank you, Chair Moya, and thank you for all my colleagues for being here. The question uh, that I have is for the record so that um, the individuals that are here and that are also watching, particularly the Black Association, understand environmental concerns were uh, paramount to this project. Can you talk to us now about your understanding of how the environmental issues surrounding this project, uh, given its previous use, how those will be addressed and how those will be uh, how the community, rather, will be informed of the environmental review. So um, in connection with the environmental review of the land use application, uh, an e-designation um, has been imposed on the site or will be imposed on the site uh, um, if this application is approved. Um, and that e-designation uh, for hazardous materials is going to require us to submit um, both our phase one environmental site assessment um, as well as a phase two sampling protocol where we're going to um, provide details of proposed sampling um, that gets submitted to the city's Office of Environmental Remediation um, and they will work with us in establishing um, proposed drill um, test pits so that we can test the soil to confirm whether there is any subsurface contamination. Um, we can provide a copy of the proposed um, soil sampling to um, your office, uh, Council Member Cumbo, um, and advise the neighbors as to where we've worked with um, OER to establish where sampling is going to occur. Um, we will do that once the phase two sampling protocol is approved. Um, by OER, we will then conduct the actual sampling. 
the results of that sampling have to be permit, uh, submitted to OER. Um, if any contamination is found, we will have to remediate uh, and, and clean up any contamination that exists before um, OER will sign off on the, the project, and that would be before we could pull a building permit for the proposed project. Um, so the site will be remediated if there is any contamination, um, so that it's ensured that uh, it is safe for the, the residents of the new building, but also um, part of the plan that is submitted um, for any remediation um, takes into consideration protection of surrounding neighbors, making sure that during our soil borings, during any remediation activity, that we are taking measures to prevent any contaminants, uh, should they be there, um, from adversely affecting the surrounding uh, community members. And how long, to your knowledge, has this particular uh, lot been utilized as a parking lot? Um, so we uh, researched the Sanborn maps, which are historical fire insurance uh, maps, mm -hmm. and it, it appears it's been a parking lot since um, at least 1965. There's a gap in the Sanborn maps um, from approximately the 1930s to 1965, so we can't be certain, um, but Sanborn maps dating back 60 years um, have shown that it, it's been a parking lot. And in your experience from doing this type of work, are spaces that have been utilized for a parking lot for that period of time usually those types of lots that have uh, serious uh, environmental concerns, or are you finding that it's usually more for industrial and manufacturing spaces that were used previously? Typically it is for spaces that have been, or properties have been used for manufacturing activity. Um, the property, I will say, had at times been used to store um, some uh, solvents that were um, used by the, the prior owner in some of their other properties in, on the block. Um, we believe it, the property's been capped, uh, but that is the reason why our, our phase one, which is just a visual site assessment, um, didn't recognize any uh, environmental conditions. Notwithstanding that, uh, we are mapping the E designation, which will require us to actually do the borings and confirm whether there is any um, subsurface contamination. I just want to I understand everything that you stated. I just want you to work very closely, as you stated, with my office, but certainly hand in hand with the Block Association around the environmental review process. Um, so that the neighbors, um, the community, the block association are well informed of the progress um, so that they can have the peace of mind and comfortability um, as construction is happening. Understood, and, and we're happy to do so. Can you talk to me about uh, the architectural design of the parking lot in terms of how that's going to be structured and what that's going to look like? And So the, the parking lot um, will be a subsurface parking garage. Um, we would have one uh, entrance on Bergen Street um, on the east side of the building that would lead down to a ramp. Um, currently we're proposing self-parking because we have enough space um, for the spaces to be, uh, for cars to maneuver in and out within the garage. Um, and uh, right now we have 13 uh, parking spaces. Um, I think as I had mentioned in the presentation, uh, eight are required under zoning. I think that's a phenomenal aspect of this project because so much of the development that we see, um, developers are often coming to waive uh, their parking requirements. So this is really positive that for this neighborhood that uh, that level of parking will be coming into the community. Can you also talk about the um, the the top? So the the roof will be utilized in what way? For solar panels, or will it be utilized or ac accessible to the residents of the of the building? So the very top of the building will be a combination. Um, so this would be the fourth floor roof, would be a combination of, of solar panels provided it's economically feasible for this size of a development um, and a green roof. Um, if the solar panels don't um, prove to be feasible, um, it would be an entirely green roof, but it would not be accessed by um, the members of the building. The, uh, the, the third floor, um, in the rear has a setback 
the fourth floor has a setback above the third floor, um, and the front setbacks would be private terraces for members um, who are residents who live in those units. And then just my, my, my final question sure. on this, I wanna open it up to my colleagues. So one of the main things that happens in this process is that there are many things that the residents would like to see um, binding mm -hmm. as part of the project. Often we can't make everything that we'd like to see binding, but what we do rely upon is the fact that the developer has a previous track record and would also want to move forward with doing other projects in the city that it would behoove them to have uh, a good record of um, adhering to what's provided in documentation, mm -hmm. understanding what residents in the district have stated that they want to see as part of the project. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the developer's past and um, some of the projects that they've done to demonstrate that they are um, listening to the community and we have a good understanding that they will also continue to do so? Yeah, I think one of the, the developer's uh, recent projects um, would be uh, in Fort Greene on Adelphi Street where they basically um, purchased a dilapidated uh, rundown uh, church um, and did a significant amount of restoration in connection with uh, landmarks approval to preserve the church. The church was um, located in a historic district but not an individual landmark. Um, and, and really spent significant resources um, to, to make this a, a beautiful place um, to live. It was converted to residential, but they were able to uh, maintain the structural integrity of that church. They used local um, Brooklyn um, uh, companies to provide new stained glass. Um, and I think we bring that level of commitment to, um, to our projects. Um, uh, the, pro the, the developer also owns 594 Dean Street, which is actually located immediately behind the property. Um, there has been concerns that have been raised uh, with to us about the one of our tenants in that building, which is the U.S. Post Office. Um, we've been we've heard the, the considerations of the community. We have repeatedly been speaking to um, the post office to try, uh, try to address some of the concerns. I think some of the issues um, are uh, contributed by the Pacific Park Project, which has closed portions of Dean Street and added to the congestion. That being said, we're committed to a continuing dialogue with the post office, but I would actually um, reach out and request your assistance as well in trying to deal with um, the post office because they are a gover federal government <laughs> um, agency and, and have not been as responsive as I think uh, we would like as well as um, some of the members of, of the Dean Street Block Association. Certainly, okay, thank you. I can't promise miracles there, but I certainly will work with you. I, I, we appreciate that. <laughs> okay, um, that's the end of my questions. I'm gonna turn it back over to the chair for potential additional questions from my colleagues. Thank you. Is there any? Questions? No. Um, we have. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much that we're done with this panel, and we have uh, Kate uh, Carsweller, Crassweller. Uh, she is from the Bergen and Dean Street Block Association. better okay um, my name is Kate Craswell I'm here representing the Bergen Street and Dean Street Block Association um, we have been um, as Mr. Ryan Smith said um, in discussion about this development at 590 Bergen Street I believe um, Councilwoman Cumbo and Mr. Ryan Smith 
covered quite a few of the questions and concerns we have about the development. Um, the first being the scale of the proposed development, and we do appreciate that in the previous talks that um, the uh, agreement that the setback go to 15 feet and the dormers be removed um, to help um, really keep this building in keeping with the landmarked character of the um, adjacent uh, historical district. Um, as uh, Councilwoman Cumbo uh, said, we would really love to see that this could be a binding stipulation within the rezoning application so that we have um, confirmation as the development goes forward that this um, setback uh, of 15 feet without the dormers can be um, uh, permanently set. Um, we also, uh, as you mentioned, um, the roof space, we want to also ensure that um, sort of minimal um, structures or minimally visible structures are, um, are set on the roof so that there are, is no disruption to, again, the visual sight line of the landmark district. Um, um, things like elevated solar panels, cabanas that could lead to the overall um, extension of the height of the building as seen by the street, um, we would be opposed to. So we'd really like the assurances of the developer that, that um, any uh, developments uh, on the roof are um, limited and minimally visible from the street. Um, but again, I think you covered um, some um, concessions um, that were agreed upon um, on this topic. Um, the other issue that you touched upon is having uh, the developer have um, access, 24-hour sort of um, telephone access to the community members. There have been a lot of issues, uh, as you also touched upon, with the USPS and tenants of the Dean Street um, development. And uh, the neighbors um, continue to have issues with safety and disruption um, from the tenants of the developer's building. So it's very important to us as a community that we have access to um, help and responsiveness um, via this um, uh, uh, pathway of communication um, uh, as this development goes forward. So again, if that can be um, somewhat set or binding, it would be really reassuring to the neighborhood. It, the Dean Street um, uh, development that has been done by this developer has been problematic. Um, and so we just would really like the community to have somebody um, that can um, uh, that can be reached at all times as this development goes forward. Um, and then the third thing that you, that we had concerns about, but also that you touched upon was the environmental issues. Um, yes, the lot has been used as uh, parking over the decades, but also as you touched upon as chemical storage at points. And so uh, we would really appreciate partnership with the developer as this process goes forward um, in um, uh, this phase two env uh, environmental sampling. So. Uh, we just like w we'd like those three things that have been discussed to be um, definitely uh, followed through with with this development. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Councilwoman uh, Cumbo. Uh, would like to read a statement. Thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak this morning on behalf of 587 597 Bergen Street rezoning. I appreciate these opportunities when the public can share their thoughts on the process and the application. I thank you. It is meaningful to allow the hopes and aspirations of our constituents to come forward. And I would like to acknowledge Kate Crassweller from Bergen Street, as well as Alicia Howard from Dean Street Block Association. As your council member of the 35th District, I represent Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Prospect Heights, Crown Heights, and parts of Bedford-Stuyvesant. Um, as you can see, just by naming those communities, we know that there's a vertical boom that is sweeping all throughout our area, particularly downtown Brooklyn near Atlantic Avenue and Fulton Street. And developers are moving into the area and very quickly changing the landscape. But we must recognize when there are in fact projects that come to the forefront that can provide meaningful housing stock, particularly affordable units where we need the most in the 35th Council District. I'm very pleased that this project uh, doesn't dramatically change the landscape. Um, it's contextual, it fits within uh, the height requirements within that particular area. We have met with the developers and expressed the urgency by which the dormers must be removed. Um, and this was a stipulation that the Block Association put forward. And I believe that this partnership or being able to come to an agreement um, shows a certain strong act of good faith. 
I also appreciate the community and the developer agreed on a good neighbor policy and having a 24-hour contact number during construction. And I think that this is going to set a precedent um, throughout our district in terms of what responsible development looks like because so often development happens and residents have no way to contact anyone um, about anything from rat infestations um, all the way to garbage removal and the time in which work begins um, which changes from time to time. I'm also very pleased about creating a plan that has fair affordable housing and administered through a not-for-profit and we are working with the development team to um, identify that not-for-profit that has deep roots in the community is crucial to the success of the project. And anemones and finishes for the MIH units must be the same for those that are market rate. So that was also an important uh, stipulation that the Block Association and the community want to make sure that there is consistency so that the affordable units do not look different um, from the market rate units. I'm pleased that we were able to come to a strong compromise on the MIH option where we are going to have between 8 to 10 of the 26 units are going to be low income and affordable units. This is uh, for those making between uh, $30,000 to $70,000 a year for a family of four which is a very important uh, opportunity uh, for those at different income levels to be a part of this process. I appreciate the developer's choices to select green and sustainable design features and integrate the work of local artists and or artisans in the proposed development. Many of you may know my background and I certainly um, like to see creativity um, as well as local artists that are part of the community um, to be allowed the, the opportunity to create creative spaces um, that are keeping with Brooklyn culture. Lastly, local hiring and MWB participation is essential and it is our collective responsibility to actively reach out to the surrounding community, including minority and women-owned businesses, small businesses, and entrepreneurs. Uh, we must take stock of innovative companies that are entering the market as well as industries where MWBEs have not previously operated in and figure out how to utilize their services. This is the best way to ensure that MWBEs are competing on a level playing field. Thank you for allowing me to express my support for this application. Um, hearing the commitments of the developer um, has made this project meaningful for the community, and I thank uh, everyone that has participated. I particularly thank the Block Association um, for making this a better project, a more responsible project, um, and one that we can be proud of. Thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you, Councilwoman uh, Cumbo. Uh, are there any members of the public uh, who wish to testify on this item? Seeing none, uh, we will uh, now close the public hearing uh, on these items. Uh, I will now be calling a vote on all the applications on our calendar. Uh, we will be voting to recommend approval of LU2, uh, the Brown Sugar Bar and Restaurant Sidewalk Cafe, and we will be voting to recommend the approval of LU3, the Bedford Avenue Commercial Overlay Application, and to recommend approval with modifications of LUs 4 and 5, uh, the Bergen Street Rezoning, the modifications to LUs 4 and 5 is to eliminate the MIH option 2 in order to ensure that the development utilizes MIH uh, option 1. Uh, Council members uh, Levine, Rodriguez, and uh, Cumbo uh, support these recommendations. Uh, we are also voting for uh, to file LU 1 and the El Patino uh, Sidewalk Cafe application. Uh, this application was withdrawn after the Department of Parks and Recreation uh, determined that the cafe would interfere with uh, their construction project on the sidewalk. Um, are there any questions from the members of uh, the subcommittee? Seeing none, I will now uh, call on a vote to approve LU2 uh, and LU3, approve LU4 and 5 with the modification I just described, and file LU1. Um, Council, please uh, call the roll. Chair Moya. Councilmember Grinenshi. Aye. Councilmember Consens Nevis. Aye, I know. Councilmember Lansman. Aye. Councilmember Levin. Aye. Councilmember Richards. Aye. Councilmember Rivera. Aye. And Councilmember Torres. 
By vote of eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, LUs two and three are approved. LU four and five are approved with modifications, and LU one is filed, and all items are referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. You're not really supposed to